Take a person, take a story, take you on a journey. It's your take. My guest today is a US musician who attended music school and then made the decision to move to New York City to chase his dream. It was here where he met musician Mark Knopfler whilst working at Rudy's Music Stop. He would join Dire Straits as rhythm guitarist after the departure of Hal Lindy's. My guest went on to work on the seminal album Brothers in Arms, tour the album globally, perform at Live Aid, and play on the popular songs Money for Nothing, Walk of Life, So Far Away, and Brothers in Arms. After the birth of his twin daughters, my guest became a marketing executive and then, would, and then would go on to become a popular writer. Today I talked to Jack Sonny about his life and his many guises. We discuss music, fame, and being in a successful band, fatherhood, and changes to his life and career. I should say we're, we're good evening here. It's on 10 o'clock in the UK and we're four o'clock in. Yeah, just about happy hour here. In... <laughs> good afternoon. In... Where, where, whereabouts are you based in the States? Uh, I'm in uh, a very small town called Taylor, Mississippi. Population 343 plus me and my dog, Abby. Um, I'm about 10 minutes, it's a small town, 10 minutes south of Oxford, Mississippi, which is where the University of Mississippi is. So it's a college town, small community. Um, it's got, it's just jam packed with great writers, great musicians, great artists. It's a very blue dot in the middle of the Red Sea, as we like to call it here. Um, super liberal and progressive and very supportive of the arts. And I feel quite at home here after traveling around the world. I'm very much admiring the paintings in the background as well, the Joni Mitchell, of course, and um, Jimi Hendrix. And I'm certainly looking forward to talking to you about music and your career. And I mentioned at the beginning, you have many different guises where you've gone from <laughs> music into other careers as well, which, I find very fascinating, but I kind of wanted to go back to the, the very beginning, mm -hmm. basically where, where it all started. Turning the clock back a long time ago to 1954, you were born December 9th, <laughs> Indiana, yep. Pennsylvania. I just wanted to kind of paint a portrait to the, the viewers and the listeners about what your childhood was like and kind of just describe what, Pennsylvania was like growing up sort sure. of you know what you can recall in the late 1950s and and into the 1960s decade yeah man well you know western Pennsylvania out um, out towards Pittsburgh that side of the state uh, both my grand you know it's the uh, foothills and coal mining hills of the northern Appalachia and both my grandfathers were coal miners, spent their life working in the coal mines, something that I can't even imagine doing for about five minutes. Um, I have my dad's side of the family is Italian. My mom's side of the family is Swedish and Polish. Um, they are first generation uh, family, uh, <laughs> son and daughter of immigrants. My, both my grandparents, all my grandparents came over from various old countries. Um, so, you know, it's a very rural area, obviously, you know, with coal mines, a couple of my uncles were uh, dairy farmers. Mm. It's, um, rolling hills and cows and <laughs> Christmas trees. It's like Indiana, Pennsylvania is known as the Christmas tree capital of the world. And just so like, you'll, you'll see complete farms of, pine trees that get cut and sent, I guess, all over the country <laughs> for, for Christmas. Um, you know, Indiana, not a very prosperous town. It was a small college town when I was growing up. It was a state teacher's college. Um, 
It's the home of actor Jimmy Stewart, um, who was probably one of the you know most famous names out of there. Mm. Um, and you know, not a whole lot going on. I mean, my school, uh, my entire you know sort of high school, it was twelve hundred kids in it, grades nine, ten, eleven, and twelve. And I could look outside my, you know, schoolroom, out the classroom, and across the street from the class was cows, you know. And for me, as a kid who, at an early age, was interested in in music and art, and there was nothing there that I could see that I belonged to, or oh. as part of. I wanted to come on to your parents because I wanted to find out who they were as people and what they did for their professions and also find out if you grew up with brothers and sisters as well. Sure. Um, I have one sister who's uh, about four years younger than I am. Uh, she lives with her family in Connecticut. Um, she has two, uh, I have a niece and a nephew. Um, they have fabulous grandkids and, you know, we're, we're very close. We talk pretty much every day. Um, it wasn't always that way as, you know, when you're growing up and there's four years between you and your sibling, that can cause some problems, you know. Um, it's like, I don't know her. <laughs> but, um, my dad was uh, a, a, an auto mechanic a, 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 as a young man, uh, worked at a you know, a body shop and a dealership and then entered the army uh, right when I was born um, and was in the army for a couple of years. We traveled all over the South, which I think is where I got my first taste of, of wanting to live in the South and Southern food and Southern culture. I was very young, obviously, but um, I think it stuck. He was not a musician, but he loved music. He would sing along with Frank Sinatra and Dean Martin and Johnny Cash. He was a huge Johnny Cash fan. Um, and they, my kid, they were swing era kids for the most part, could jitterbug like crazy. They were great dancers. Anytime a family reunion would happen or a wedding or something, eventually they'd be out on the dance floor and the dance floor would clear and, and they would do their thing, which was always fun for me to watch and something I wish I had learned, but I never did. Um, my mom, uh, played piano and so there was uh, always a piano in my house growing up she would play the families both my families are very large and music was a part of every gathering that that we did on my mom's side you know there was be a Christmas dinner and there would be 40 cousins and aunts and uncles and all of the kids had to get up and perform some kind of music thing you know which was always fun and terrifying for some, some, <laughs> my sister always hated it, but I was always like, hey, I'll get up in front of anybody and sing and play. <laughs> I could dance too, watch this. Um, which I actually did take tap dancing lessons when I was a kid. Okay. Um, so, you know, my mom, they were, you know, no pun intended, they were instrumental in getting me into, into playing. The mm. weird part about it was, you know, I saw the Beatles, I was listening to, to music mainly AM radio at that time. And in the States, AM radio was this fabulous mix of, of programming. You would hear, like, literally, you, you would hear Frank Sinatra, and then you would hear the Supremes or the Temptations. And then you would hear, you know, early rock and roll or Johnny Cash. It, it was just all one. It wasn't all balkanized and segmented. So I got exposed to a lot of stuff. And the same with like the Ed Sullivan show and any, uh, any of the other music shows that started to happen. It was a really mixed bag. And I loved Motown. I loved that music as a kid. And uh, I, you know, love dance beats. I love that sort of soulful rhythm, R&B, Stax, Sun, you know, the early, you know, Al Green, all of that stuff. I'm just a huge fan of and was as a kid. And what I wanted to do was nice. sing like Marvin Gaye. 
t- timeless music as well that stood very much stood the test of time. Yeah, I, you know, running my radio station for a while, I put it on, and it just, I mean, I love playing that stuff. And for me, the goal was, like I said, I wanted to sing and wear like a badass shark skin suit and have dance moves coordinated with my band. But then I saw the Beatles. And man, like so many other, you know, musicians of my generation, seeing the Beatles on Ed Sullivan, and obviously I'd heard, heard a couple of, you know, of the singles before that, but they really exploded here on the Ed Sullivan show. And man, I watched that and was like, just, it was an out of body experience for me. And watching John Lennon, I was like, that's what I wanna be. That's who I wanna be. (laughs) You obviously were exposed to music at such a young age and you mentioned the radio, which was such an important part of people's lives back during those days Mm -hmm. before we were exposed now to so much content and so much music. Right. And you mentioned the Beatles, so many bands were just turned on by their music. But I kind of wanted to ask you, you went from obviously the passion of seeing and hearing these artists, but what kind of actually got you playing instruments? Because you started playing from quite a young age, playing guitar and piano and so on. How did you kind of make that transition from the actual listener to wanting to actually pick up the instruments and play for yourself? Well, again, I I really, you know, I mean, I was taking piano lessons um, from the time I was about nine or 10 and, um, you know, enjoyed it, but, you know, that's not what I wanted to do. And certainly at 14, 14, I guess it was like somewhere around there, seeing the Beatles, I was like, oh man, I got to get a guitar. You know, I just have to have a guitar. And I would talk to my parents and go, okay, i you know, piano's okay, but I want to play guitar. And the weirdest thing was like, there was some kind of strange speech vortex between my lips and their ears. And every time that I said guitar, they heard trumpet. And it was like, oh yeah, you can play trumpet. And I'm like, no, I don't want to play trumpet. I want to play guitar. And my mom's like, well, you you can't be in the marching band playing a guitar. And I said, yeah, exactly right. I do not want to get my ass kicked every <laughs> being one of the band geeks. It's like, that's not what I want to do. But somehow I ended up playing, you know, that was, and one of the, the best and worst days of my life was when I got braces on my teeth and I couldn't play. They hurt, but I couldn't play trumpet any longer. I was okay. like, woohoo! <laughs> I wanted to move on uh, from the music and talk. Mm-hmm. A little bit about your time at university, because you originally went to study literature at the University yeah. of Connecticut. Right. And then, however, kind of uh, due to your love of music, you decided to leave and then attend Hartford uh, Conservatory of Music. Um, what kind of made you decide to kind of make that change? And I kind of ultimately wanted to ask you um, what you learned from your time at, at music college, what that kind of taught you, your, your time there. Yeah, okay. Well, yeah, that transition, you know, from, from a very young age, even though, you know, music was a passion for sure, mm. it hadn't really sort of become the forefront in my brain of like, yeah, I, I want to go be a rock star. You know, it was a fantasy, obviously, you know, and I would stand in front of the mirror and practice my temptations moves or, you know, John Lennon stance and, you know, lip sync along to, you know, all of that. And then Jimi Hendrix came along and it was like, whoa. But, you know, up until that time when anybody asked me, teachers or adults would ask me, what, what do you want to do? You know, that, what do you want to be when you grow up? Um, I always said, I want to, I want to sit under palm trees and write novels. And that was it. That was like, I want to sit under a palm tree and just write. And, you know, so that was sort of the more prominent drive for me in going to school when it was like, you know, you got to, you're going to go to college. It's like, okay. And I got there and it was just like, I was losing interest in it. Uh, There was nothing. I just wanted to write. 
I didn't want to learn other shit, you know? I mean, I'm, I'm well-read. I've always been well-read, uh, curious about things, but, and as I started to I joined a band and started playing out around town, this is when we had moved to get to Connecticut, the bug just took a hold of me and I was like, oh yeah, this is what I want to do. And I was playing six nights a week uh, after I got out of music school, I was playing in a band six nights a week. It just, it just like, yeah, I love this. I'm, I feel I'm a good performer and I'm good on stage and I'm going to pursue this now. <laughs> so what did I learn in music school? I learned that I'm not a jazz guitar player. <laughs> I learned, I learned that I'll never, never be able to read music as fast as the other guys in the class. <laughs> um, and that, uh, I'm not a I'm not a deep technical player with regards to you know knowing a million modes and scales and it's just not my thing. Sure. And um, I was after I got out of school, I was two year program, like I said, and I was you know I mean my I was so wrapped up in that point with Jimi Hendrix and uh, Jeff Beck and Dwayne Allman, the Allman Brothers. It was like this was my focus and I didn't really care to learn what George Benson or Joe Pass or any of those players. Now I kind of wish I had, but it'd be fun to sit down and play some of that stuff, but I can't and no regrets. But I, you know, the more and more I started to play and it was actually my dad. I went to my dad at one point and said, you know, I don't know what I'm doing here in Connecticut. Um, I need to find somebody in, in New York to study with, you know, to break out of this thing. And through a mutual, a guy that was playing in my band happened to know Steve Gadd and, and Tony Levin and who are, you know, an amazing top chair drummer and bass player. Tony's played with Peter Gabriel forever. And Steve Gadd has played with, you name it, you know, um, and it blew me away that my friend Michael knew these guys. And he said, oh, yeah, call them up and see who's given lessons in New York. And I'm like, you got to be kidding. I mean, I'm looking at like album covers with these guys' names on it. And it's like, oh, yeah, Steve Gatt played with Steely Dan. Whoa. Um, and, and Paul Simon. And so I, I pick up the phone. I call. I guess I got. Yeah, it was Tony who I talked to first. And his first question to me was, if, if you're playing with Michael, who was this keyboard player, why do you need lessons? Because Michael was a flat out genius keyboard player. And I said, well, I wanna, you know, I think I need some help maybe getting into New York and all that stuff. And he said, well, the only guys, I know two guys. One is Steve Kahn, who was, is the son of Sammy Kahn, the great, you know, sort of sta uh, standards American songbook songwriter. And he's a great guitar player, more of a jazz guy. And he said, and oh, there's this guy, Elliot Randall, which, you know, I, I just lost my mind. I was like, Elliot Randall, the guy who played real, the reeling in the years solo. And he's like, yeah, he says he's given lessons these days. Call him up. This comes, <laughs> this comes on quite nicely to my kind of next mm. point in the story, really, because you graduate from music school. And obviously the, the introduction to Elliot Randall is obviously significant because he becomes kind of a mentor and a teacher and you build this Absolutely. kind of strong rapport and he also kind of encourages you to chase your dream and move to New York yep. um, and kind of embrace the the music scene going on there I kind of just wanted you to talk about your relationship and looking back in hindsight how important a figure was he in kind of just really kick-starting your, your whole career yeah um yeah so you know i'd gotten together with elliot a few times to take lessons which a lot of the times just ended us hanging out once you know once we played a couple of things together and he saw where i was at it really became sitting around his place and him playing albums for me and turning me on to players that i was not aware of and that he felt would be important and it really opened my head to a couple of things um, 
So how important was he to my career as a player and as a human being? Absolutely critical, absolutely critical. And I have hailed him <laughs> through the years and told him repeatedly how much he meant to me. And I'll, I'll try to do two quick things that really set, set things on fire for me was I was playing a Les Paul at the time. And even though I was a Jimi Hendrix freak, I had tried to play strats and, you know, I'd worked in guitar shops even before going to New York. And I just could never figure out how anybody could play a Stratocast. It just, I was like, man, this is impossible. These things play like shit. And I would pick up my Les Paul and go, yeah, but it didn't have that sound and didn't af afford me to play the type of things that Hendrix was doing or the type of things I heard in my head, you know? And Elliot played my Les Paul and he's going, ah, that's really nice. He goes, try this. And he hands me his number one strap, which he used on all those sessions and played that solo uh, on, and, and it was a, like a 1961 strap that had a humbucker pickup in the neck. And I picked it up and was playing. It was like, oh my God, this thing plays like, like butter, it's nuts. How is, and I started doing all these little Hendrixy things that I knew and it's like, it was just coming out. Mm. And I'm like, what the hell, man? And he told me that he had replaced the frets with higher, this is in the days before you could get like real customized stuff done. And he said, these are bass frets. So they're fatter and higher. And I use really light gauge strings. I was like, shit, okay immediately went back from my, that day with him in New York and bought a 1963 Stratocaster for $275, which like today, if I owned, I'd have a house, you know, on Long Island or something. But anyhow, I had that guitar. I sent it to the guy who did his work, had that guitar set up. It was my number one. And it changed the way I played and approached my guitar. I got rid of my Les Paul and that guitar was my guitar. And I've been a Strat telly guy ever, ever since. since. I was going to ask you, what year are we looking at when you made the move to New York? And I kind of wanted you to just describe what the scene was like at that time. And when you moved to New York, did you have kind of a, a plan or kind of a purpose in place? Or did you just kind of almost just like improvise and just sort, <laughs> you know, let, let's Let's see what happens, yeah. you know, let's see what, let's see how things kind of go from there. Yeah. Um, well, it was 19, end of 1976. Um, and so I go to New York at a time when it's fabulous and dangerous all at the same time. And it's the sort of the last few years of disco, punk is coming up. There's no rock and roll. Yeah. It's all, you know, the Eagles and Journey and, you know, Boston and all that crap, just whatever corporate, you know, kind of, so that's going on. The punk scene is coming up and I'm not a big fan of that either um, because I don't know, it just did, I, you know, like given my background, Stones, Hendrix, R&B, and while that stuff could be found in there and the clash, you know, kind of rubbed up against that, you know, and a bunch of their stuff. Hey, quiet. <laughs> um, you know, it's it just and they, and they were more of a rock and roll band, I think, than most punk bands, at least in my thing. And I, mm. it just didn't touch touch me. The Ramones didn't. I like yeah. the New York Dolls, but that was a different <clears throat> thing to me. Um, they were more Bolin, you know, Bowie kind of stuff in my brain. Um, Mott the Hoople. So. The scene was just, it was alive and electric. I mean, you know, we're talking about this just massive influx of, um, you know, Madonna's coming up, Billy Idol's coming up, the singer songwriter scene. I spent most of my time on Bleecker Street in Greenwich Village, which was more focused on a lot of singer songwriters great ones, ones who got record deals and kind of launched out of there. And that's where I, when I formed my own band because I quickly discovered, talking about a plan, I had no plan. Elliot said, why, are, why aren't you moving to New York? And I was like, oh, I don't know. 
And I went home and told my dad, I said, I think I got to move to New York. And he said, I've, I've been wondering what's taking you so long. And he drove me to New York and dropped me off at a buddy of mine's apartment who I shared a place with when I first moved there. And I started hanging around the clubs and Elliot introduced me to a few people. And I quickly found out I was not cut out to be a session guy. It was like, not my thing. I'm not pol politically wired for it. I'm not that adept and I can't read other than chord charts. So, mm. you know, getting asked to go do a Ford commercial and looking at, you know, fly shit on a piece of paper was just not me. And I really, all I ever wanted to do was to play in a band. I just wanted to be in a band and, you know, be Keith Richards to somebody's Mick Jagger, you know, and, or John Lennon to somebody's McCartney. And I, you know, formed the leisure class as my band in New York in 1977. And it's been my, the name of my band ever since. And I couldn't find a singer that I liked. And I just started fronting the band and singing. And so it's, I was, and I'll tell you, the other thing that Elliot taught me, this, this is, this to me is the, one of the most important things that cha truly changed my life. And I think, well, he came to see me play one night. I'd been in, in town maybe like a year and a half and I was playing mm. with uh, a singer, so a female singer songwriter that he had done some work with and he recommended me for their live stuff. And we were playing this small club in New York City and it was Sunday, Sunday night, I think. And Elliot came to see, it came and, you know, to check it out and, see me play and all that kind of stuff. And we do the first set and I get off and go sit down at the table with him. And he looks over and he says, are you having a good time? And I'm like, yeah, <laughs> of course I'm playing guitar. And he goes, well, it really doesn't look like it. And I was like, huh? <clears throat> and he said, yeah. He said, you know, these people, they come to see somebody do something that they can't do. I'm like, okay. And he was gonna sit in. <laughs> <laughs> the next set and he said it was almost like watch grasshopper and learn you know <laughs> and he got up and just grinning you know that kicked into the tune and he was just grinning from ear to ear and making eye contact with people in the room and going up and smiling at him and he grabbed a beer bottle and like played slide and you know was just looking at the other members of the band and he was having a ball and I was like, oh, and he gets off and I got to go follow that, right? <laughs> he gets off and he sits down with me and he said, he said, look, he said, tomorrow when these people go back to work, he said, they may not remember, her name was Jane. He said, they may not remember Jane or the band, but I guarantee you they'll tell their friends that they saw me or some crazy guitar player in you know playing and he was wild and great and it was like he handed me the key and permission to do a lot of the stuff that i had kept myself from doing mm. on stage i mean i was a huge hendrix fan you know i i watched jimmy move and, and like all the dance moves and all that stuff was part of me and i just started doing it it was a kind of like in my head, I guess I thought, well, oh, I'm saving it for when I make it and the band is on a bigger stage or whatever. Every stage that I played on from that day after was if I was sitting, standing in front of the Live Aid audience. I played like it was one, the last night I was ever going to play, and two, as if it was just a crowded house. And it changed the effect I had on, on people in the audience. It was like, I am having so much fun. I love what I do. And all I want to do is share that joy and fun with you. And that's been my mantra since day one. And he is totally responsible for that. Talking about musical showmanship, we kind of move on to the part of the conversation, which I'd imagine you've been asked hundreds and <laughs> hundreds of times before and recounted the same stories yeah. time and time again. But it's obviously such a, significant part of your career and obviously your, your life as well yep. when you're working in a a music store called rudy's music stop yeah and in in walks a huge 
artist and musician at the time, Mark Knopfler. But I wanted to ask you your initial kind of relationship with Mark when you first met him and how that kind of went from him <laughs> just being a customer in the shop, talking about guitars and I presume asking you to recommend which <laughs> guitar he should buy or which set of strings to say, and actually, do you want to be in my band? And they're quite a big band. Yeah. So would you like to come on board? Well, there's a bit, of, there's, there's a, you know, a big gap in that, in that time frame. but it, just, I, just I gotta be honest. yeah, I'm going to be really honest. There's a couple of things that like always surprise people, but, and I, I'm, I, this is the honest to God's truth. I was not a Dire Straits fan at all. I heard, I heard Sultans of Swing one night with other members of a band I was in at the time, not, not the leisure class, but other members of the band that I was in at the time that had a, a recording deal and we were getting ready to go out on the road and we were in a car together and the guitar player, the other guitar player in the band, Saltons came on and he cranked it up and he was all excited and he, and he said, this is the type of thing we need to be doing. We need to be getting back to the roots and all that stuff. And I went, well, if that's what you're gonna do, I'm out. I mean, I, you know, I'm in New York, I'm a Hendrix freak. Peter Gabriel has happened, Talking Heads is happening, Adrian Ballou, I mean, funky, you know, more electric, David Bowie's stuff with Earl Slick and, and Carlos Alomar, that's where my head was at. And that's what I love to play as a rhythm guitar player. Like the first time I heard Stay on the Bowie's, Bowie's Station to Station album, that had that same effect to me that, that Sultans had on the other guitar player. I heard that and was like, that's exactly what I want to do. This hard rock, funky thing. So anyhow, Straits, Straits comes to New York City and they play the bottom line. And it's like their big sort of New York debut. So I go with, with, with one of my buddies. The band comes out, starts playing, and they are like the most boring, sleepy thing. I, and on, as God is my witness, and I've told Mark this, I fell asleep at the mm. table. While we while it was on, and my my bass player who was with me, towards at one point he like elbows me, and I wake up and he goes, "You might want to wake up. They're going to play that song," and they played Sultans. <clears throat> and when I talked to Mark years later about it, he was like, "Oh, I had had oral surgery that day, and I was on meds, and I was playing like shit." I'm like, "I don't care. It's like you guys were boring." He comes into the guitar shop one day, hmm. and and the other thing is like Rudy's quickly became, because it was just focused on guitars. It wasn't an all sort of, you know, keyboards, PA system, sax, like all the, most of the other shops were. We were just focused on guitars and custom guitars. Vintage used and custom stuff. And so I was dealing with like first name, first call, famous guitar players all day long, pretty much. So it was, it was second nature to you then, basically. Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah. you know, and yeah, I mean, I sold that black black Schecter Telecaster that Pete Townsend used during the 80s. I sold him that. I sold it to Alan Rogan, his, and I sold a, a couple of guitars. Gretsch, I sold um, Elvis Costello a couple of guitars. The session guys that came in, you know, I was taking care of them. Again, you know, guys who were playing with Steely Dan and every first call. So I'm not that easily impressed. And I don't mean that as a dick, you know, it's just, this is the world that I'm in. And you have to also remember at this time, Straits had pretty much disappeared in the United States. The second album didn't do anything. Hmm. They were viewed at this point, 1982, as kind of a one hit wonder in the States. Everywhere else, obviously they were doing really well. And Mark was in town starting to record making movies. He wanders in one day when I'd got a terrible hangover. I'd been out, played a gig, went to the after hours clubs and, and came straight to the shop at 6.30 in the morning, unlocked the shop, went to sleep on the floor and then opened the store at 10 o'clock. And I was just like, oh man. And Rudy comes in and tells me, oh, this guy, you know, Mark, Knopfler, he couldn't pronounce his name or, you know, the name of the band or anything, came in and he's looking for guitars. 
So I said, oh, great. Mark comes in, hang out for a few minutes. You know, he starts talking about guitars, said that Bonnie Raitt actually sent, recommended him to come in because we sold these Schechter guitars and did custom stuff. And I pulled out a couple and played with them. You know, I'm just like, here, man, go play. Kind of like sit on a stool in the back and just like, just raise your hand when you need anything, but be quiet about it. Okay. And he hung out all day. He hung out all day. And as we were getting ready to leave, he asked me, he said, what are you up to? And I said, well, I don't know, going, going home. And he said, um, you look like you, you could use a drink. You want to go get one? And I said, fuck yes, I do. So we went to a little bar, you know, like not too far from Rudy's. And we hung out and we started talking. And from that day forward, you know, he, he had moved to New York and he really didn't know anybody in New York. And he mm. got married to Lords at the time and, and they had a place. And so it just became a thing where he and I started hanging out almost every night. Either go to his place, he'd come over to my place sometimes. And we would, he, he was into cognac at the time. <laughs> he would crack these expensive bottles of cognac and we would listen to music and fucking argue about, about shit. You know, he was trying to convince me how great Bruce Springsteen was. And I was like, that's bullshit. And, <laughs> and I'm trying to convince him that he needs to listen to James Brown and Miles Davis. And, you know, it was just fun. Two guys hanging out. Yeah. And I pulled no punches with him ever. You know, it was never like, oh, he's a big rock star. And, you know, I need to be nice to him. It's like, I don't give a shit. Because the crazy part was, and at that time, I was so convinced because I was writing my own material, the band was recording. I was like, dude, I'm one phone call away from what you've got. Now, that's not that is not to compare my guitar playing ability with his because he's a fucking genius, you know. And but I have my thing. And I was like, I'm going to get a record deal. You know, it's all going to be good, man. We're just hanging out. And was it? Was it a question of being offered the position when a fellow American guitarist, Hal Lindy's, left the band <laughs> after kind of Love Over Gold, the studio yeah, album? Yeah, so that, yeah, the, so that the, goes live on. Live Alchemy one as well, yeah. Yeah, so the pattern was, you know, Mark would hang around, they would record, he would work on an album. I saw Love Over Gold go from literally from his notebook to the recording. I was around for some of those sessions, drop in and hang out. I helped dial up some guitar tones for him on, uh, he was working on Local Hero and the um, rhythm and lead guitar sound on Going Home. I got a phone call from him and Neil Dorsman one night to come up and help him dial up some stuff. So I did that. And we were just hanging out. He would come and sit in with my band, you know, when he was around. And then he'd go record the album, then he would disappear and he would go on tour. And he'd be gone for like nine months. And I would get random phone calls from around the world from him. Hey, what's going on? Just two, again, two guys. At the end of 85, 84, 1983, I got, I got kind of ill, a um, little, little bit of a mystery disease. And I, I really made the, made the decision at that point that I was going to give up playing, pursuing the rock star dream and go back to school and study literature. Mm -hmm. I didn't tell anybody about it, but by the end of that, by December of that year, I'd gotten accepted to Fordham University in New York City. And I was going to go to class and I was going to work at Rudy's and who knew what, no plan after that, you know. Um, and in the meantime, Mark was down in Montserrat. He had been in London rehearsing and he was in Montserrat working on the album. He came home to New York City for Thanksgiving, which is, you know, just a few weeks ago. And he, we were sitting at the bar together, as we always did, and we were talking about shit. And he's, he starts bitching and moaning about, you know, how things are different than when he started and that bands are weird. And, you know, he had just wanted to play in bands, you know, he missed playing with friends in a band and all that kind of stuff. And I was like, yeah. And then he starts telling me that I should quit. You know, he said, you should just work at Rudy's and have a good life. Believe me, I hit the lottery, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, oh, it's easy for you to say it happened for you. Now, in the meantime, I've already made the decision to quit, but I'm not telling him that. So, so that's Thanksgiving. He's complaining 
you know, and to be honest, and listen, I don't, I, I've never spoken to Hal. I, from all accounts, you know, people that know him, he's a lovely guy. I've heard him on, on you know, the recordings. God bless him. Um, I can say that Mark was never really happy with his contributions, specifically on recordings, that he felt that, at least that's what Mark told me. And again, mm -hmm. I don't know, there's two sides to every story, maybe three, but I'm just saying, so that was going on in the background. A couple of weeks later, I get my acceptance letter and it was like right around this time, right? My birthday is coming up in a couple of, couple of days. Next week, next Thursday. It was right around this time I get the letter of acceptance to Fordham and I'm like, woohoo! I call my parents, I tell them I'm going back to school and I'm gonna do this. And they're like, well, it's about time, yada, yada, yada. I don't have the conversation with Rudy yet because a couple of days later, Mark calls me up in the, it's early in the morning. I haven't quite gotten it up to go to work yet. Phone rings, I pick it up and it's him. And it's honestly not that unusual because he would call me from all over the world. I would get, you know, crazy phone calls from just to talk, you know? And he says, hey, down here, we've had to make some changes. How, what do you think about coming down and finishing the album and doing the tour with us? And I was like, I wasn't even awake. I hadn't even had any coffee. And I like banged the phone down on the floor. <laughs> I was, so is this a crank call, dude? What, who is this? He's going, no, this is, you know, not bullshitting you. He said, yeah, you know. And the first thing that I say is, Mark, it's coming into the Christmas season. I can't leave Rudy's during the holidays. Are you out of your mind? <laughs> and, and he's like, he starts laughing. And he said, because I'm like, I, I can't do that to anybody. That's my job. And, and he starts laughing. He goes, don't worry, I've already talked to Rudy. So he had the conversation with Rudy before he called okay. me. And you know, then I went into work and saw Rudy and you know, it was like all, it was on. And literally, so Mark said, don't worry about it. We're gonna take a break over Christmas. We'll come back down in January. So he came home, we hung out. I helped Rudy through the Christmas season and literally went from working in the, in the guitar shop one day to getting on an airplane, first class from the first time in my life and flying to Montserrat with Mark beside me, Neil Dorsman across the aisle and in the chair in first class next to, next to Neil who was the engineer and producer were the master digital tapes strapped into their own seat on the oh, wow. airlines. And I'm like, oh man, this is rock and roll. This is what the, the Allman Brothers used to buy, plane seats for their guitars. I've made it. You know? And the, the, re <laughs> the rest is history. But I kind of wanted to ask you, you obviously friends with Mark for so many years. And then your kind of first project is recording the the now seminal album, uh, Brothers in Arms, which was a massive yep. commercial success and the global tour, which went on, I think for so many years around the world. But what was it like recording that particular album? And I also wanted to ask what it was like working under Mark's kind of musical direction. A couple things I want to say first that in all of the years that we were friends, it never came up. I never mentioned, he never mentioned me playing in that band. Mm. It was never, at one point, Mark actually, you know, in a, a drunken evening for the two of us, he turned to me and he said, what is it that you want from me? And I was like, I don't know, another glass of cognac? This is good shit. Well, so well, listen, like, we'll listen to some more Miles Davis. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Can we put on James Brown live at the Apollo? <laughs> um, instead of Bruce Boringstein. Um, <laughs> yeah, you'll be getting and, a lawsuit on your hands from the boss yeah, man. Yeah, I know, man. <clears throat> we, so, and it, you know, I made it really clear to him that, you know, I, I just want to, I'm just here to hang out as friends. I don't need anything from you. I don't expect anything from you. And if you ask me again, our friendship is over. And that's sort of the Italian in me. It's like, dude, you know? So it never really came up. So when I, when I got there, they were already three months into the recording. Um, 
they had struggled to make it work. It seemed when when they were playing bits and pieces of what they were working on to me, you know, I was listening to it. And one of the things Mark told me early on, and I, one of the reasons that I think I was was there was our relationship was based on pretty, you know, unfiltered honesty. You know, he knew that I, if he was going to ask me a question, I was going to give him an honest answer, my opinion. So he's playing this stuff for me. And I'm listening to it. And I actually turned to him and said, you've been here for three months and this is what you got. I said, man, I was like, what the hell? Honestly, I mean, it was like, I couldn't make heads or tails of it. And he had changed his approach to recording from the other times when he'd done other things with the band. He had spent time with um, uh, Brian Ferry uh, playing on, you know, uh, maybe it's Boys and Girls. I think there's, there's a couple of tracks on that that Mark played with. And those guys, you know, Brian and Rhett Davies, like it was all vibe in the studio. They would create tracks and then Brian would write some lyrics and kind of follow it wherever it went. And Mark seemed to be like playing with that in his approach to it. It's like, we're just gonna, we worked on some of the tunes, let's see where it goes. And that confused, I think, a lot of the guys in the band. That's my, you know, my assessment. And so it was over the next, three months of recording that things started to take a little bit more shape. Um, my involvement in that recording was as far as playing, actually playing and recording guitar parts, there's only one. And that's on uh, The Man's Too Strong. Um, I helped shape the bass part to Right Across the River. Um, and you know, had some input on Money for Nothing and mm. uh, uh, So Far Away. And by that, I mean just sort of what Mark's approach would be, what instrument he might play, you know, parts and things like that. Um, so, you know, and every, I, every night afterwards, I would spend time with him and he would ask me what I thought about this or thought about that, and, you know, and I would tell him, you know, it's just like, I think this is working, that's not working, please, you know, the line, see the little faggot in the tutu and the makeup. I said, tutu is weird, man. It's like, how about earring? Earring. A lot of people still think that any dude with an earring is a fag. I said, you're going to have trouble using that word too. But, you know, um, so, you know, that was my sort of thing. Um, I want to. I wanted to at this point go from the actual recording of the album to the the actual tour, um, 1985. I just wanted to ask, kind of, any standout moments from that particular global tour, and how do you look back at the the band's performance at Live Aid again in in the year 1985? I'm sorry. Ask me that again. <laughs> I'm sorry, Chase, I, was, I just got a text that I needed to answer real quick. No, 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 that's fine. I wanted to kind of go from the the album to the actual Brothers in Arms tour. Yeah. I wanted to ask any standout moments from that particular tour, and how you look back at at the Live Aid performance. Well, you know, the tour. I mean, obviously, it was my first time on any kind of a large stage like that in a production of that magnitude. I mean, it was, it was kind of shocking and wonderful all at the same time. After years of playing nightclubs and doing kind of smaller tours, to be able to like step on stage with this massive band and hear myself, hear my vocals and hear my guitar playing was just so, was like, oh my God, this is incredible. You know, Cause it was loud and it was beautiful. Um, you know, the tour, we, we did rehearsals in what was then Yugoslavia, and we did some initial uh, shows there. Um, you know, the one of the highlights was, was going to Israel and playing shows in Tel Aviv, two outdoor shows in Tel Aviv, and two outdoor shows uh, outside the city walls of Jerusalem in a place called Sultan's Pool. Um, there's, in the video for So Far Away, there's some clips of us at that sound check and I think some of the gig. And it was just magic. I mean, 
you know, I had no idea what to expect by going to Israel. Um, it was nothing like I thought it would be, but it, I mean, it was amazing. And the Sultan's pool was at one time the Sultan's swimming pool and it's this natural amphitheater. And, you know, the band is in the deep end and playing up against the wall and the city walls of Jerusalem are just there. And people were sitting up there, people were in trees, people, there were helicopters and security flying around. It was just amazing. And when we did Brothers in Arms, I was in tears and I know Mark was emotional about it as well. And so that was a highlight. And, you know, going to Live Aid. So we're out on the road from remember, March, like April, end of March, the beginning of April. And this is in the days before cell phones, before the internet. And you were lucky if you would find a hotel that had CNN or maybe MTV, but it would generally be, I don't know, the German version or the French version or whatever, you'd be watching it. So the first we heard of, at least I heard, and so most of the band heard of this Live Aid thing, was we were on the bus one morning, I don't know, Belgium, south of France, I have no idea where it was, but it was in the middle of the early part of that tour. Tour manager gets on and goes, hey everybody, um, you know, when we get to London, we've got a bunch of dates at Wembley Arena that looks like they're all gonna be sold out, blah, blah, blah. And in the middle of that uh, run, Bob Geldof and some other folks have put together this big charity called Live Aid for Africa and the bands decided to do it. Now by the band, he meant Mark and John. And so they've decided to do it and everybody just kind of went, okay. It's like, <laughs> sure. Everybody puts their headphones back on and tries to go to sleep to the next town. And it wasn't until we got to London, um, the early, early July, end of June, maybe uh, July. And I'm in my hotel room and I flick on MTV for the first time in English. And I, there's all this talk about this thing called Live It. I'm like, holy shit, this thing is huge. And then I start getting messages from friends in the States going, are you guys really gonna be part of this? Do you know it? And I'm like, I have no idea what this thing is. We literally went across, we were playing Wembley Arena. Yeah. And I know I've told this story mm -hmm. a bunch of times, 14 shows, all sold out. In the middle of that run was Live Aid. We performed at like, you know, four in the afternoon or something like that. We literally walked across the parking lot played our 20 minutes, and then walked the back gig. across the parking lot <laughs> and did a gig that night. So I missed, you know, tw I missed hearing Queen. You know, we were 20 minutes after our set, we were across the parking lot back in Wembley Arena. So I missed one of the greatest performances of, you know, our generation or of many generations. I thought our performance was pretty damn good as well. But Man, Freddie and those guys just, um, that was phenomenal. Absolutely phenomenal. So I missed all of it until I got back to my hotel room at like 11 that night, 11.30 that night and caught a couple of the last things and turned off before they did Let It Be. Because I don't Inc need to hear that song ever again in my life. Incredibly, you achieve your ultimate dream of being a rock star and kind of many a young boy's dream of wanting to be in a rock band. But kind yeah. of before I finish the interview, I kind of wanted to talk about 1988 onwards because you change careers. It's incredible. Um, you become a father to two twin daughters, and then you decide to kind of give up music and a new career, second career as a marketing executive. I kind of wanted to ask you, how did that all kind of come about, really? Well, it was a combination of, of things. You know, um, I, my music career didn't, I didn't leave music career, really. Mm. It was gone before that point. You know, Mark, Mark decided to take three, you know, his pattern, like I described, of kind of like, you know, writing a new album, recording a new album, going out on the road, touring for a year, taking a little bit of time off. That pattern he had repeated for a long time. And 
the assumption was that that was just going to continue, but it didn't. You know, he decided to take a long time off and figure out what he was going to do, which, you know, God bless him. I mean, that, he has that right as an artist, obviously. And, you know, even though there had been many conversations between him and I during the time I was with the band about things that would or might happen together after that never came about. Mm -hmm. So there was a, a period of time where I was sort of hanging around waiting and talking and working on some of my own stuff and talking to him about what might happen and nothing did. And it was at that same time that um, I got married and my daughters were born. And that to me was like, okay. And I had gotten some offers. Rod Stewart was one of them. Steve Jones from the Sex Pistols, oddly enough, was putting together a band at one point. He and I got connected. Um, he, he was doing a much more of a real rock and roll thing, which would have been fun, but that didn't come around. And, you know, so I was banging my head against the wall. My own thing wasn't happening. And when the girls came along, I said, you know, I don't want to put them through this roller coaster. It's not fair to them. I've, I, I had, I caught my dream. It doesn't last for everyone. You know, it doesn't, it, some people it does, some people it doesn't. And it didn't for me, but uh, I was very happy to be a father. Um, uh, because of my retail background and having worked in all these, you know, guitar shops and record stores most of my life, I had a lot of connections with product manufacturers. I called up my buddy Seymour Duncan, who makes guitar pickups, and I had sold his pickups in the store, and I was an endorser of his, and we were good friends. And I called him up and said, Hey, I'm getting off the road. I've got a family now. You got any room for me? And he said, after a conversation with me, he said, I think you'd make a really good marketing manager for us. And I'm like, great. When do I start? And what's a marketing manager? I had no clue. And I basically learned on the job. I thank, I'm so grateful that they gave me the chance. But I also found that the advertising and the creative end of it was really fulfilling to me. I really enjoyed it. I you know, got a chance to write a lot of copy. I worked with graphic designers to do um, the ads. I, you know, worked on product design and that career went on for 20 years working for, you know, various different companies until I, you know, ended up as the vice president of marketing for the guitar center retail chain. And I did that for a bunch of years when my girls were um, done with high school and getting ready to start on their path. I decided I couldn't do that any longer, that uh, there was a, a chain of events a uh, dear friend of mine passed away from lung cancer. My sister got diagnosed with cancer. My brother-in-law got diagnosed with cancer. And my dad got diagnosed with Alzheimer's. All like in a chunk of, you know, span of about nine months. And my sister and brother-in-law are both survivors. My dad passed um, several years ago now. And uh, like I said, my good friend passed away from, from cancer. And I thought at that time, you know, if I get a phone call from the doctor and there's a bullet with my name on it and that's my fate and all I've spent my last 20 years doing is trying to convince other musicians to buy another piece of gear they probably don't really need, I'm going to be really pissed off if that's my legacy. And I decided one day I'm going back to being a writer. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to let that dream die. I saw what happened to my, my father after working his entire life to retirement and then it just disappearing. I was like, I'm not letting that, I'm not going to do that. And so I walked into my boss's office, quit, walked away from a very high paying gig. And another new career, another career. Of, and it, now it's it was 2006. It's interesting how things have kind of gone full circle because at the beginning of the conversation, we spoke about your love of literature. You obviously went to study literature and writing at, at uni university. That didn't work out. And then again, it comes full circle. You become a writer. I wanted to ask you about your writing work and, you know, how long you've been writing and, and some of your published work. Well, at this point, I, I've been writing 
on and off all my life. Seriously writing though, you know, probably since 2008, you know, when I sort of, you know, quit the gig and, and spent some time kind of letting, washing the corporate world off of me, um, I started seriously writing. And I first started to work on a memoir, which is like what everybody, it was like, everybody told me, oh, you got to write a memoir. You're a great storyteller and you've got all these stories and you need to tell your story. And I'm like, okay. And I spent a bunch of time doing that. And I got an agent right away. Um, we got close to, I got a, had a couple of publishers interested. And this was right at the time when all the big rock star memoirs and bios were flooding out. It was like Keats and Eric's and, you know, and the publishers are kind of going, yeah, who's this guy? You know, and I, you know, I had no interest in writing a sex, drugs, and rock and roll memoir. That's not what I was interested in. What I was interested in was really diving into what drove me and what drives us to pursue dreams at the expense of everything. Hmm. Your health, your career, you know, just family. You're just determined that you're going to become this thing. When the real goal is to become you to understand who you are and be that. And that perspective changed my life a lot again. And, you know, one of the things after that was what I really wanted to write was fiction. I love reading novels. That's all I've ever read most of my life. I had never read a memoir before I started to write one, <laughs> which is probably not a good idea. <laughs> but, you know, like you've seen, I, whether consciously or unconsciously, I somehow have a trust in, in my instinct. And if, it's, if it doesn't work out, you just adjust and go with it. You don't give up. I mean, it's like, what, what are you gonna do if you give up? And, you know, I have a finished manuscript for a novel. It's in the hands, it's, it's been in the hands of a couple of agents. And I'm sending it out to some more and I'm pretty, pretty hopeful and confident that it's gonna get sold. And um, now that means even if it got sold tomorrow, it wouldn't see the light of day for two years. But hey, writing something I can do until the very end, you know, hopefully. And so nothing published. Um, I do, you know, blog from time to time and write personal essay type things on my website. Um, and, you know, ran an internet radio station for the past year. I just decided to shut that down recently. And I just got offered um, my own podcast from Newsweek uh, organization who are launching a, a pretty serious podcast organization. So awesome. I'm pretty excited about that. Yeah, sounds interesting. I was going to yeah. ask you one final question sure. before we wrap up the interview and we we ask these kind of questions at the end to all our guests. So my, yeah. my, my last question before we move on to the, the last quick fire ones was in recent years, you've returned to playing music on a, a regular basis mm -hmm. with your band that you've mentioned, uh, the Leisure C, uh, sorry, the Leisure Class mm -hmm. and the Dire Straits Legacy Project as well. Right. However, however, when you look back at your life career, the opportunities, the moments, how would you sum it all up? And do you intend to pursue another life passion? Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, you know, it's been, a, it's been a wild ride. I mean, you know, you can only, you know, make sense of your life when you have enough perspective to look back on it and, and, kind of understand how one thing actually led to another, mm. whether by chance or design. And often in my life, it has not been by design. You know, while I'm chasing, you know, rolling some rock up a hill like Sisyphus, only to have it roll back down again, some other thing happens. You know, it, it's sort of like what happened with this podcast thing. I shut down the radio station. Two days later, I get an email from a buddy of mine who said, I just got a new job running this thing. And I want you. And, and it's like, okay, one of my greatest passions is getting together with friends, connecting people who are kindred spirits, and just hanging out 
and sharing what we do and our ideas and, you know, having a salon. I've always wanted my living room, my dining room table. I wanted to be in a place where I could have interesting people come and hang out and bullshit, you know, and turn each other on to music and food. And I love to cook and I love making cocktails and I have friends in all these different disciplines and, that it's and just a riot to hang out li with. So, listen, listen to Bruce Springsteen records as well. Yeah, you know, everybody knows there is <laughs> this, uh, a no Springsteen and no Eagles yeah. zone over here. Okay. <laughs> but, uh, I'll say so, no more. Yeah, that's you a whole other subject. But um, so that passion, which will really, you know, the podcast will become a platform for that. I mean, I've, I've enjoyed and I'm so grateful to have traveled and been around the world. And I know people in so many places that I've managed to connect, you know, from different coasts and have them somehow end up in the same place at the same time and realize that they are the same person or, you know, the same, same love and passion. And that just makes me really happy, you know. We move on now, Jack Sonny, to the questions that we ask all our guests. We always <laughs> ask them this. We ask things they like, things they're not so keen on, and we always get kind of an interesting range of answers. So don't think too much about these. These are kind of just quick yeah. um, questions just to wrap up the interview. Um, question number one, what is your favorite pastime? Getting together with friends, sharing food, music, and our lives. That's, that's my favorite pastime, for sure. Interesting to hear what you say about this one. We've spoken in depth about music, 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 and more music. Now we move on to cinema. What would yeah. you say is your favorite film and why? Well, you know, the knee-jerk reaction is the Godfather trilogy, and, and that's, you know, besides being absolutely brilliant and, and my Italian background, recognizing a bunch of the characters in it. But there's a movie called The Assassination of Jesse James by the coward Robert Howard, which is starred uh, Brad Pitt as Jesse James, Casey Affleck as Robert Howard. The cast is just fantastic. The screenplay, the script is, is almost verbatim from a great book by Ron Hansen. Um, I, I can't recommend it highly enough. If I've got one movie that I can watch over and over and over again, it's that movie. It's brilliant. And the, the book has one of the greatest openings of any book I've ever read. And they do a great job with a voiceover in the film by a British voice actor who reads it in an English, American accent. <laughs> I do love Westerns, so I've not seen the film. I know the film, so I'll, I'll definitely watch that Highly one. Recommend it. That and Tombstone, you know, I mean, we can go down the list, but Tombstone with uh, Kurt Russell is a, another great one. You've spoken in depth about your love of writers and the history and origins of writing and so forth, but who is your favorite novelist? Wow. That is so tough. When I saw that, that question, I knew this was going to be a tough one. Um, over for most of my life, I would say uh, Don DeLillo, I think is, is he's one of the great, great American 20th century American novelists. Um, of his latest things, he's call, kind of fallen out of my favor. I'm not quite digging what he's up to. Um, Man, I just know so many really great writers. Tom Franklin, who is a, a American Mississippi writer, mm. feature here, we've gotten to be really good friends. He's written a collection of short stories and two novels that are just head and shoulders above anything. I mean, he's like the bar for me. If you could have chosen a different profession, you've, you've had, you've <laughs> had quite a few. Bad. <laughs> what, what would it have been? Um, I, I would like to have been uh, an English literature professor at a small private women's college in New England and the coach of the women's volleyball team. 
which I'm sure would not have gotten me into any kind of trouble <laughs> whatsoever. That was that was a boy's dream once upon a time. <laughs> um, who in life would you say has been your greatest inspiration? Oh man. That's really tough. Muhammad Ali. You know, I mean, it's it sounds cliche, kind of, really. But, you know, I don't know how much more of a mm. human being, you know, who stood for his beliefs. Um, and, you know, affected the world in a major, major way. Um, Certainly put boxing on the map. And I... To be honest, the thriller in Manila is still probably my favorite boxing fight oh, of all man. time. Ali versus Frazier, part three, and what a brutal oh. fight it was. It could have been anyone's, you know, anyone could have won that. Probably the fairest result would have been the draw, in, in yeah. all honesty. Incredible yeah. fight. Absolutely. Do you read a newspaper? And if so, which one? I do. I read the Washington Post. Um, it's... I don't know, you know, these days, fair and balanced, I don't know. Um, but I, I read it for sort of the news and the opinion section if I really want to get my blood pressure up. Well, next one, what would you say is your favorite food? Oh, man, come on. <laughs> Pizza. Pizza. Fried chicken. Pizza. Uh fried chicken P pizza pizza is definitely the yeah, oh man it's a tough one you know the last meal definitely gotta ne be pizza. <laughs> next one who would you say is your favorite cultural icon uh you know interesting because you know the inspiration thing and this i thought about this it's like um and i'll get into trouble for this too but i at one point i was going to switch that to muhammad ali mm. but um Che Guevara. What would you say is your favorite curse word and why? <laughs> and you can say it. Well, you know, I mean, we're, we're past the watershed here. It's, ha it's half, yeah, ele no, half yeah. 11 UK time. So anything Don't be goes. Fucking beep, beep bleeping me out when I use my favorite fucking curse, curse word. Fuck is like just one of the most perfect words, you know, ever. And you know, Billy Conley, I think, has, has just has a great, great thing on it. And George Carlin, it, you know, it's the range of usage of that word. Now, if I wasn't in America, I'd say my favorite, favorite one that makes me laugh that I would get in so much trouble is cunt. When I hear, when I hear the Brits, y'all use that word, I just laugh my ass off. And think of how freeing it would be to be able to use that word. But man, I have dropped it a couple of times. <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> I'm what, lucky I get out alive. What would you say oh, is your favorite um, place or holiday destination? Oh, wow. Um, I haven't spent enough time there, but Sicily um, and uh, Sicily was just fabulous when i when i visited there really really enjoyed it would love to go back and spend a lot of time there what would you say is your greatest achievement to date um i'm going to tell you this with a caveat okay raising my twin daughters and the caveat being, oh, my daughter Nadine died three years ago. And uh, that's a, a guilt that I will never get over. Um, not because 
I was directly responsible for her passing. I wasn't. Mm. It was an accident. But, you know, you come up in my cultural background and, and you're, as a father, it's your job to protect your kids. And I failed at that. So what was all these different things, all these guises, as you call them, all these coats that I've put on throughout my life and personas, which become your identity. And that's actually what my memoir was dealing with. You know, you become a rock star, finally, your identity gets wrapped up in it. And when it disappears, it crushes you because that is no longer your identity and you have to answer the question well what are you then? who are you then? and for the longest time my persona my identity was the single dad who raised two beautiful daughters and i cherished that identity it was something i was very proud of and feel like it was t- it it got taken away from me so I had to spend time once again searching for my identity and how to come to grips and terms with the fact that, yeah, I was a dad who raised twin daughters, but I no longer have twin daughters. So when the conversation comes up about that part of my life, there's always that unspoken reality that if someone doesn't know that part of it i Mm. am conflicted about do i say anything do i tell people Mm. does that make me feel better or worse how does it make them feel Mm. so and you can tell it's a very raw place for me Mm. three years later it will never go away and as many of my friends have told me and as i tell myself it's something that you never get over you can only hope to get through it and that's i give my other daughter katie so much credit for her being stronger than me and helping us as a family get through it My final question is how how do you wish to be remembered, Jack (laughs) Sonny? Well, someone who was kind, someone who loved bringing friends together, bringing people together to have a good time and enjoy being in each other's presence. I think that's a a nice note to end on. And I wanted to firstly thank you kindly for giving up your time, um, an hour plus of your time to to do the interview. It's been a, a pleasure. And to be honest, it's been, for me, a really insightful and interesting journey, what you've done in your life. And also, it's kind of been almost a bit of a tuition as well from, you know, all the, the great things you've achieved and obviously tragedy, which you've spoken about at the end of the conversation. Um, thank you for being so honest. Thank you for your time. And I suppose lastly, to close, I just wanted you to kind of tell the listeners if they want to find out more about your writing, more about your music more about kind of your life, career, your stories, moments. Where do yeah. they go? How do they find out more? Well, I, I appreciate the thanks, man. It was fun to do it. And I, you know, enjoyed talking to you for sure. And it's always, you know, kind of interesting to revisit a lot of these things for me. And, you know, when you asked me to do it, and you're going to get, when, 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 <laughs> when you ask me these questions, you're going to get the honest answers. And it's welcome to Planet Jack. This is what you get, baby. 
So it, with regards to like where folks can find me, um, jacksonny.com. You know, my website's out of date. It's being rebuilt. But that will be the focus of, you know, where I, I cut off all of my social media mm. uh, platforms. It's just, you know, a waste of time and a toxic wasteland. Um, and so the website and when the news about the uh, podcast will certainly be there and to when that gets launched and you'll get to hear a lot more about what's going on on Planet Jack. <laughs> so. Thank you again, Jack Sonny. And yeah, we'd love to see you, see you in the UK, you know, always welcome and Appreciate love, it. To, love to meet you in person. Absolutely. You know, if uh, the plan is hopefully come spring into summer, you know, the leisure class is looking to get out and, and do some touring. Um, and man, I would love to get back and play some pubs. Be awesome. <laughs> Have a nice pint and get down to it. It's been, right, an honor, been an honor, a pleasure, yeah, and Thank thanks, you so for, thanks for being on your take. Got it.